We're in July. It's a month where we have been building margin, right? Maybe, hopefully. Allowing the hopefully slightly less intense pace that summer brings to allow us to reflect on what, did, what does it mean to live with a little bit of margin, live with a little bit of breathing room. Just take a deep breath with me. So we're not just stressed out all the time. We're not just active all the time. But instead, we're open to noticing what God is doing around us because God is active around us all the time. So over the past weeks, we've been talking about what would it mean to have a little extra calendar margin. That we've been learning that we are at our best when we get some rest. That, that's, that's worth writing down, right? In case you didn't know. You are at your best when you've had some rest. And God actually encourages us into rhythms and patterns of work and rest. Work, 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 rest. Work, 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 rest. So we've talked about what it means, excuse me, to have a time of pause in your day. Just to spend time with the Lord in prayer and in the word and things like that. We've been talking about what it means to have Sabbath in your week. So whether that happens on Saturday or whether that happens on Sunday, but that there is a day in the week that is set apart just to renew yourself in Christ, to rest and allow God to refresh you. The importance of having those holy days or holidays, that there are seasonal breaks as well. God designed us for this. You are at your best when you've had some rest. And so it's been fun to hear how people have been applying that. Some people have been adding the, uh, the hours to like their smartwatch or their smartphone or whatever. Just things that remind them to take a pause during the day to rest. I've heard others talking about how they're just f- trying to figure out. So what does Sabbath look like for me? What is the day of the week? What's my Sabbath day? Like, and what does it mean to take some time? It's just really encouraging to hear how you're building margin. And then last week we talked about how it's not just about giving God our calendar, but it's more about giving, also about giving God our attention. And especially because there are so many things that are fighting for your attention right now. Thousands, literally thousands of ads a day. Screens Everywhere. Everywhere. I mean, they're in your car. They're on your, it's your, your phone has become a screen. There's, there's screens everywhere. And so we're learning to pay attention to the things that are trying to take our attention. Because God is at work everywhere. And God, unlike the screens around us, don't always flash. There's not always get, Bouncing balls and gifts and kitten videos and nothing wrong with those things. But, ex- except for this, when it takes our attention off the Lord. So, I've had, heard some just wonderful conversations of people that are processing that. Like, what would it mean for me to, to put a few more boundaries around my smartphone use, for example? So, we're building margin. Now today I want to talk about the aspect of margin that um, well if it's if it's not the not the piece that causes us the greatest degree of worry it's probably pretty close. That all of us all of us at times whether that's now or on an ongoing basis or at certain times in your life all of us have worried about money. You know we get distracted from God's work because we're too busy, we're, well, we're too distracted, and sometimes just because we're too broke, or at least we feel like we're too broke. We feel like we've got no money, and so now we're all worked up. And because that, be, when you feel like you lack money, and especially if you're a responsible person who wants to provide for your family, a lack of money ends up feeling pretty vexing. So you're thinking about it a lot. 
So we've been coming back to this same passage in Matthew chapter 6. So if you've got your Bibles out, I invite you to turn to Matthew chapter 6. We're going to look at verses 25 through 34. And um, actually this week I had a, I, I was, uh, I'm, I'm getting ready to start a doctoral program this fall. And so there's, um, there's a bunch of books with that. And I've started reading some of those because that's just who I am. And, uh, and I was reading, there's a book called Jesus, A Theography. And there's a section in there that is, uh, that, that's talking about like what might have been going on for Jesus in what you would think of as the in-between years. The, uh, you know, the, the years between age 12 and age 30. Because we have these little snapshots of Jesus' life at age 12. And, but then he comes on the scene again at age 30. So what was going on during that time? And of course, there's all sorts of different people writing all sorts of different things about that. Um, the, what it looks like is the case there is that Jesus just continued on with his, with his um, well, his earthly father, his adopted father's Joseph's trade. And so he was the tradesman, just living in Galilee, working in the Nazareth area. And here, this is speculation, admittedly, but it's kind of interesting, and I promise it's going to get to a point. Um, is, is that as far as we can tell, his, his earthly father, his adopted dad, Joseph, died before Jesus was age 30. Because he just doesn't show up in the biblical account after, you know, after the, the narrative of him at, at Jesus uh, visiting the temple at age 12. And so what that means is that with, um, with Jesus being the eldest of the family, that he would then be responsible for the well-being of the family. He'd be the, he's the oldest son, right? And so I, though we don't know whether or not this scene happened, it's somewhat speculation. It's pretty likely that it did. So here's Jesus. Let's imagine Jesus at age 20. Unfortunately, his father, Joseph, has passed on. He's working the trade. And he's in between jobs. And he's the breadwinner. He's thinking about his mom, Mary. He's thinking about his brothers and his sisters. And he's feeling a weight of responsibility to provide for them. So Jesus is walking the street of Nazareth, this dusty road, and he's wondering about where, where his next job is going to come from. And he's starting to feel a bit of worry, just like you would. The book of Hebrews reminds us that Jesus was tempted in every way, just like us, and yet was without sin. And Jesus, who has been communing with the Father his entire life and has been growing in his awareness of, of the unique call that God has on him, the, of, of the Messiah, fully God, fully human. And he learned the lesson that he is then at age 30 as he's delivering the Sermon on the Mount to his disciples and ultimately through the Bible to us. That Jesus, Jesus was tempted, tempted to wonder about where the next paycheck would come from. Doesn't that just feel familiar? And so Jesus, because he has learned these lessons, because he has learned to trust in the Father, because the Father has been teaching him what it means to trust in God's provision, Jesus, as he's Speaking to his disciples from a mountaintop, he says these words in Matthew chapter 6, verses 25 through 34. Therefore, my friends, I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food? And the body more than clothes. Look at the birds of the air. They don't sow or reap or store away in barns. Yet your heavenly father feeds them. 
Are you not much more valuable than they? Can any one of you by worrying add a single hour to your life? And why do you worry about clothes? See how the flowers of the field grow. They don't labor or spin. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. So if that's how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? So do not worry, saying, what shall we eat? Or what shall we drink? Or what shall we wear for the pagans? They run after all these things. And your heavenly Father, he knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. And all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow. For tomorrow will worry about itself. Every day has enough trouble of its own. So I thought it might be good for us to spend a little bit of time together looking at what God's word tells us about money, how we handle money, and especially about what it means to be generous and to be trusting God with our resources. So here's a few really key ideas that the scriptures tell us about, uh, about money. First thing is this. Everything is God's. Say that with me. Everything is God's. Everything we have is a gracious gift from God. So Psalm 24, the earth is the Lord's and everything in it. Or uh, James 1, 117, every good and perfect gift comes to us from Heavenly Father of lights. Every good thing we receive is ultimately from God. Does it always feel like that? Talk to me. Yeah, yes, no. It doesn't always feel like that. We don't always think like that, but it's true, isn't it? And because, because everything comes to us from God, we still have responsibilities. We are called to be stewards, to be wise stewards of the gifts we've received. You think of all the parables, that talks about the different servants and people get different things and the master goes and then he comes back and he checks and sees how the servants are doing. So he's calling us to be wise. He entrusts things to us. Everything comes from him and he entrusts them to us. And we're called to be wise with what we've received. And part of us being wise with what we've received is that we are called to be generous. Just as God has been generous to us. We are called to be generous. Just as God has been generous to us. So here's, here's the big idea. If you only remember one thing from today, here's the big idea. Is that generous people experience God's generosity. Generous people experience God's generosity. Now, some of that, <coughs> excuse me, some of that, I think, is that God chooses to supernaturally bless people who are generous. He loves people who are generous because he wants to bless the world. And so he's looking for channels and conduits to bless the world. And if you're someone who allows the some of the resources to pass through, he wants to be more generous to you. So that's part of it. He wants to bless the world. And so he's looking for people to bless the, the world through. Secondly, is that as we grow in generosity, it also changes our fundamental relationship with money. And so it helps us to become more wise stewards because we start to realize that the gifts that we've received aren't actually ours. That everything that, that we have in our life is ultimately a gift from God. Right? The room is getting quiet. Yeah, I know. I know. So let's take a look at what the scriptures have say uh, about what, what, you know, generosity and giving in the Bible. Now, here's, here's one of the first big ideas with that. 
Now, in the Old Testament, one of the things that the Israelites were required to do was they were required to tithe. A tithe means 10%. So if you've got 10 cows, one of them belongs to the Lord. If you've got 10 sheep, one of them belongs to the Lord. You've got 10 apples. You, you see the idea that one-tenth of everything we have belongs to God. Leviticus chapter 27, verse 30 says this, a tithe of everything from the land, whether grain from the soil or fruit from the trees, belongs to the Lord. It is holy to the Lord. So the old, in the Old Testament, the Israelites were required to tithe. In fact, if you take a closer look, at least when Israel was running in the ways that, you know, that God intended, and of course, kings get in the way, and invading armies get in the way, and things like that. There are a total of actually three tithes that are received. Um, now, there's a, there's a tithe that ends up going towards the priests and the Levites. So in modern terms, you could think of that perhaps as towards the operation of the temple or the operation of the religious systems. So a 10% goes there. There would also each year be a 10% tithe that would go just towards like the community festivals. So things that kind of help to make the community just better, that kind of thing. And then every three years, an additional 10% tithe would be received strictly for the, the widows, the orphans, and the poor. So one of the principles that we can maybe take out of that even today is to say if we're giving to God, there's kind of three broad brushstroke categories that we can say, okay, this is, this is giving to God. One is giving towards God's work through the church. So local churches and missionaries, places, places and people where and through whom the gospel is proclaimed. So people and places where we're talking about Jesus, people and places where, where we are worshiping, worshiping the Lord. So that's one of the places. The second is, is places that are just helping to make the community better. So community improvement, you can think of as part of giving to the Lord. Thirdly, is giving towards the needs of the poor. So the poor, the marginalized, the widows, the orphans, people who are at risk, that is also part of what it means to give to God. And God was pretty serious about it in the Old Testament. Malachi chapter 3 verse 10 says this, bring the whole tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. Test me in this. It's one of the few times that God tells his people, test me, like, like dare me, try me on this. Like just give this a try and see what happens. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if why I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there will not be enough room to store it. God says, I dare you. I dare you. Test me in this. Now, in the New Testament, Jesus ends up affirming at least the concept of the tithe. We read about this in Matthew chapter 23, verse 23, also in Luke 11, where he says this. Now, this is kind of this backhanded comment, but it's still, it's instructive to us. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You give a tenth of your spices, the mint, the dill, and cumin, but you've neglected the more important matters of the law, justice, mercy, and for and faithfulness you should have practiced the latter without neglecting the former so in the modern a andrew's translation is jesus would is, it's like jesus is saying it's really nice you're tithing from your spice rack wonderful keep going that's good but don't forget that the tithe is a lot more about a 10 percent then more than just 10% of your spices. It's about showing compassion and mercy to the people around you, about responding to the needs around you. So you all, you go keep on tithing from your spice rack, but don't forget the big picture. So Jesus, at least he affirms the concept. He affirms the concept of giving 10% to God. Now, 
But, he, but here's the other thing that in the New Testament is different than the Old Testament. And it's this. Is that all the requirements of the Old Testament law have been fulfilled by Jesus. So Matthew 3.17. Do not think that I came to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to what? Fulfill them. So Jesus is the fulfillment of the Old Testament law. So we're not bound by those rules anymore. So the motivation for generosity, the motivation for giving in the New Testament, in the Spirit-led church, not the law-led church, in the Spirit-led church, isn't that something that we do because we have to, or, you know, God's going to punish us, or something, something bad's going to happen. It's something that we do as a response to the generosity of God. We do it because we want to. Because God is changing us on the inside. And, and so we see that throughout the New Testament. We see this new motivation of, of trust, of sacrifice, of thanksgiving, and joy. Like in 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 2. On the first day of the week, Paul's writing to the church in Corinth, each one of you should set aside a sum of money in keeping with his income, saving it up, so that when I come, no collections will need to be made. Or 2 Corinthians, he's following up with the first letter. Chapter 9, verse 7. Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give. Not reluctantly, not under compulsion. For God loves a cheerful giver. So we're called to be generous, but the reason behind the generosity isn't like a, it's not like a tax. It's not like a, you got to do this or God's going to be angry with you. It's something we do because our hearts are being transformed and changed by the love of Christ. He calls us to be generous. So here's a few principles that, at least in my life, I found really helpful to be thinking about. So I want to pass them on. <clears throat> First is this, is the giving, our decision to be generous should be priority giving. In other words, we give to God as a financial priority. That something that in our lives is equally important to, for example, rent or groceries. Like being generous isn't something I just do when everything is awesome. Being generous is something I do because it's something I'm asking God to build into my character. Lord, I want to be a generous person. So I'm going to build generosity into my financial planning. It's a priority to me. Second piece is the, a good idea, at least as we're looking to grow in generosity, is percentage giving. This idea that we give a predetermined percentage of our income. So when we make more, we give more. When we make less, we give less. The relative commitment remains the same. So the Old Testament, the tithe, 10%, that might be a good starting place. That might be a good thing to be thinking about. That um, Because, you know, when you're making... $500 a month, that 10%, the $50 might really feel like quite a bit. Um, to continue to give $50 if you're making $20,000 a month, it's really not that generous. It's interesting how when Jesus talks about generosity, even in the stories, like remember the story of the widow's mite? Here's this little old lady, and she shows up in church, and she gives half a penny, like a super, super small amount. And Jesus points her out, and says, see, she's the most generous person here because she gave all that she had. So it's a giving is a priority and that God sees the heart of the giver. He knows what that means. And so percentage can be a good way to think about that. Um, a third principle is this idea of progressive giving. That's not a political term. That's just this idea that as we give, we look to grow in our generosity. That, we, that as God blesses us with more, we not only think about what's the, you know, Lord, as the 
total amount of my income might increase. Even if I'm at the same percentage, my, well, my giving would increase, but maybe, Lord, are you calling me to give a larger percentage of my income than I did, for example, last year? Lord, how are you calling me to grow in my giving? Help me to be increasingly generous as you provide. So here's some questions that may be helpful as, uh, as we think about like generosity and what it means to build financial margin by changing our relationship with the money that's been entrusted to us. Does my current pattern of giving indicate a fundamental trust in God? Is Jesus the Lord of my financial life? Second question, kind of similar. Does my current standard of giving require any adjustments to my standard of living? So in other words, is my giving, is it sacrificial in any way? Is my giving sacrificial? So if, if the amount that I give doesn't require any sort of change in my lifestyle, then it's probably not that generous. Third one. Am I giving thankfully and joyfully? Do I recognize what a privilege it is to be able to be involved in God's work? And so, you know, the, the question that we might want to ask is, so, you know, so what level and pattern of giving would reflect my desire to be trusting God, to be sacrificial, to be thankful, and to be joyful? In other words, Lord, what do you want me to do with your money? Lord, what do you want me to do with your money? Little illustration. Help me out with this. Pull out your steering wheel. Let's, let's pull that, pull that, uh, there we go. Pull out your steering wheel. Pull out your steering wheel. I'm driving in my car. Do, do, do. I turn on the radio. Do, do. Got you, get, your, get your steering wheels out. Come on. Play along. Steering wheel. Got your steering wheel out. Okay. Now, keeping a hand on the wheel. Okay. Who, who here has driven it? You've driven in one of those cool newfangled cars that has driver assist. Have you experienced that yet? Okay. So you got that thing, you're driving in your car. And uh, driver assist, driver assist, it's got, it's got that feature where maybe you start to veer off the side of the road and, and, you, and you can kind of feel the steering wheel bumping a little bit to the left or to the right to keep you on the road. Have you experienced that yet? It, it, it's, it's creepy <laughs> and cool. Okay, so hey, you're still driving in your car. Come on, driving in your car. I'm driving in my car. In the back row, you can do this. That's right. In the, you can do, play along, come on. I'm driving in my, I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm waiting. I'm waiting for you, young man. I'm driving in my car. Do, 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 do. I turn on. Now, if you're driving your car and you want driver assist to keep you from driving off the road, there's a key, there's a key piece to remember with this. See, the... When you feel those little nudges, you need to allow the wheel to turn. Even with driver assist on, you can still drive your car into a ditch. If you go like this, just hold it tight. Come on, steering wheel, holding it tight. And even though, the, even though you're feeling the nudges to the left or to the right, you just hold on to your steering wheel I know what, I, I, I can think of our tech team. They put up like videos in the afternoon. I already know what meme is about to go up on, on, online. Okay, but you're holding on to your steering wheel like this. And it is possible to drive your car into the ditch even with driver assist on. If you are unwilling to allow driver assist to nudge the wheel. Ooh. 
See, many of us, as we are looking for financial margin, you can, you can, you can put down your, your car for the moment. Many of us, as we're looking for financial margin in our life, we quite rightly, we call out to God and we say, Lord, would you help me with my finances? Please, help me with my finances. And God says, I would love to help you with your finances. What part of your finances are you going to entrust to me? Now, it's appropriate to have your hands on the wheel because you are called to be fiscally responsible. There are, there are people that we are called to provide for and good, healthy patterns of saving, planning for the future. That's what wise people do. But if you're asking God to help you with your finances, be prepared that he will answer. And oftentimes, that answer will be It will be the nudge. And you can resist that. You can resist that. I have yet to meet a person who has a long-term pattern of generous living that has long-term money trouble. I have yet to meet that person. Generous people experience God's generosity because God changes our relationship with the with the money that he entrusts to us and God has a way of supernaturally blessing people who are generous with their resources so I'll I just say that for this is that as we're looking at margin what do, what's it mean to have calendar margin and rest what does it mean to have some attention margin so I'm not just distracted the whole time. I'm noticing what God's doing around me. So I'm looking to build money margin in my life. Part of that is, is saving. Save appropriately. Talk to a financial advisor to help you learn how to save appropriately. The other part is growing in generosity. Lord, I'm going to trust you I'm going to trust you with my finances. Lord, show me what you'd have me do. And I will follow. Is God calling you to review what your patterns of giving are to the Lord's work. Whether that's with a local church, missions organization, some sort of Christian service organization. Is God calling you to review that? And Lord, what does it mean for me to, to trust you, to trust you with my finances? Now, if, if you found yourself in patterns, I, I, should, I should point this out, if of... Um, of uh, Maybe long-term debt, because debt can, debt, is, debt can just take away so many of our options, especially if you are paying debt uh, on something that's going down in value, you know, like credit card debt, consumer debt, that kind of thing. The, there's help, and actually, as a local church, we want to provide some help. Um, if that's you, we're starting a Financial Peace University. That's going to be one of our connection groups this fall. So be thinking about that in advance. Like, okay, that sounds like me because I am in debt and I don't want to be in debt. And so is there help? Yes, there is. That, this is it's helped, I mean, tens if not hundreds of thousands of people get out of debt. That's the whole Dave Ramsey. You've probably heard his name. But it's a great, great program. And that's one of the things that we're going to be offering here this fall. Okay? So be thinking about that. But as we look to apply these ideas to our life, a couple of prayers I'd like us to think about. One, thank you, Lord, 
for providing. 